November 18, 1952. Lieutenant Royce Williams took to the skies in his F-9F Panther, the United States Navy's first jet fighter. He launched from the aircraft carrier USS Oriskany, along with three other planes, to carry out a patrol mission in the midst of the Korean War. Little did he know that he was about to etch his name into the annals of military aviation history. After two planes in his formation were forced to return to the American ship due to mechanical issues, Williams and his wingmen found themselves confronted by seven MiG-15 fighters, taking them by surprise. Outnumbered and facing Soviet adversaries, it seemed like a suicidal mission, but they had no choice but to fight. In this new video from Military Aviation, we will uncover the story that was kept secret for 50 long years. The feat of the naval pilot who single-handedly took on four of the most powerful fighters of his time and lived to tell the tale. Several former members of the U.S. military have agreed that what happened on that cold day in November 1952 is one of the most spectacular stories in military aviation. The day had started like any other, with U.S. Navy fighter bombers operating from the four aircraft carriers in the Sea of Japan, conducting morning sorties to strike targets along the coast of North Korea. Among them was 27-year-old Lieutenant Royce Williams, who had joined the Navy as a cadet after the attack on Pearl Harbor. By the end of World War II, he had become a naval aviator and, after learning to fly the F-9F-5 Panther, he was assigned to active duty in the Korean War. On that day, after the morning bombings, he was sent on an aerial patrol mission over the Yalu River, which separated North Korea from China, and to the northeast, lay the then-Soviet Union, still under the banner of the Soviet Union. Williams piloted one of the four U.S. Navy jets that launched from the USS Oriskany. The takeoff was accompanied by strong winds and snow, causing the group leader to experience mechanical problems during the ascent, forcing him and his wingman to quickly return to the ship. This left just two aircraft to carry out the mission, which didn't seem like a problem until they encountered a surprise. The American pilots were warned about seven unidentified planes heading their way. Shortly after, they recognized them as MiG-15s, the formidable Soviet fighters. The task force commanders ordered the two U.S. Navy jets to position themselves between the MiGs and the U.S. warships. While doing so, several of the rival fighters opened fire on them. The Americans immediately returned fire, but they were instructed not to engage the Soviet aircraft from the aircraft carrier. However, Williams knew that his enemies had faster planes than his. If he tried to escape, they would catch and kill him. The F-9F-5 Panther flown by the American pilot had a maximum speed of 925 km per hour and a service ceiling of 13,000 meters. It had a climb rate of 26 meters per second and was armed with four 20 mm cannons. On the other hand, the MiG-15 had been designed for a significant advantage in the air. It could reach speeds of up to 1,075 km per hour, had a service ceiling of 15,500 meters, a climb rate of 50 meters per second, nearly double that of its opponent on that day. It was armed with two 23mm cannons and one 30mm cannon, capable of delivering deadly blows. Years later, reflecting on that situation, Williams recalled, at that time, the MiG-15 was the world's best fighter aircraft, faster, and capable of ascending and descending faster than American planes. Furthermore, his aircraft was suitable for air-to-ground combat, but not so much for aerial dogfights. Nevertheless, he found himself in that predicament, with no choice but to fight, not against one but against seven MiGs. Williams's wingman engaged one of the rival aircraft, leaving Williams in a one-on-one -on -one confrontation with half a dozen enemies. The tactic at this point was to perform constant turns and zigzags since that was the only area where the F-9F could compete with the Soviets. He was flying almost instinctively, putting into practice everything he had learned during his training, and it was working. On the other hand, the enemy fighters were also executing all the maneuvers they had been taught, but they occasionally made mistakes, and those were the moments to take advantage. 
One MiG-15 flew toward Williams at full speed, but suddenly ceased firing and began losing altitude. It had been hit by the Americans' attack, and the pilot was killed. At that moment, another Soviet fighter entered the scene and positioned itself right in front of him, but again, the American was quicker and more precise in shooting. He watched as the rival aircraft disintegrated, and he had to maneuver sharply to avoid its debris. Two down, two to go. The pursuit continued, and the U.S. Navy pilot managed to severely damage two more MiGs, which were ultimately taken out of action. It had been 35 minutes of a fierce battle, and in that time, he had expended his 760 rounds of 20mm cannon ammunition carried by the Panther. By then, Williams had also been hit by enemy fire, and his rudder was virtually disabled. The control surfaces on the wings were destroyed, and only the elevators at the rear of the aircraft, allowing him to move up and down, were operational. Fortunately, he was heading back towards the aircraft carrier, and he could attempt to return. However, one of the Soviet jets continued to pursue him, so he had to fly in a roller coaster pattern, ascending and descending, to avoid giving the enemy a clear shot. At that moment, his wingman rejoined the fight and positioned himself behind the MiG-15, scaring it away. Now the challenge was to safely return with a severely damaged aircraft. The first problem he faced was that, as his task force was on the defensive due to a possible Soviet attack, their initially reinforced air defenses thought Williams's F-9F was an enemy MiG. The destroyers protecting the U.S. aircraft carriers opened fire on him. His commander quickly put an end to that and eliminated the danger. However, he now had to land his aircraft on the ship's deck, a maneuver that is normally performed at a speed of 195 km per hour. The problem was that, due to the state of the Panther, if he descended below 315 km per hour, the aircraft would stall and fall into the icy sea. As if that weren't enough, the aircraft couldn't turn to align itself, so the aircraft carrier had to make a significant maneuver to get into the right position. Finally, all the effort paid off. Williams crashed onto the deck and caught the third and final arresting cable, the last part of his great feat now safe, the Navy crew counted 263 holes in the aircraft that had just made history. It was in such bad condition that it was pushed directly off the ship into the sea. As the plane disappeared beneath the waves, those present realized something, direct aerial combat between the United States and the Soviet Union had occurred. Euphoria quickly turned into concern. News of Williams's heroism reached the highest echelons, with then-President Dwight Eisenhower among the top U.S. officials eager to speak with the pilot who had destroyed four MiG-15s. After the battle, the naval aviator was interviewed and personally congratulated by several high-ranking admirals in the Navy, the Secretary of Defense, and the U.S. President himself. After that, he was instructed not to speak about what had happened because they feared the incident could lead to a devastating increase in tensions between Americans and Soviets, potentially even triggering a third world war. That's how this incredible story remained a secret for 50 years. In the 1990s, the Soviet Union admitted the defeat of four MiG-15s in an operation on that day in the Korean War but without providing further details about the embarrassing loss. It wasn't until 2002 that records were declassified by the United States, and at that time, Williams could share the events with those closest to him, with his wife being the first to learn that her husband was a war hero. In the years that followed, veteran groups who knew of the feat argued that the Silver Star Williams received in 1953 was an insufficient reward for his achievements, and they pointed out that he should receive the highest military honor, the Medal of Honor. One of the individuals who pushed for this was California Congressman Darrell Issa, who stated that Williams is a top gun pilot like no other, and an American hero for all time. Finally, at the age of 97, the veteran received a new decoration, the Navy Cross, symbolizing the second highest military honor in the service. Now, it's time to bid farewell. Thank you very much for accompanying us to the end. Stay tuned to our channel for our next video.